Professor Yogi, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. It's yeah, a pleasure to be here. Congratulations on thank receiving you. the Nobel Prize in Chemistry and first Saudi national ever to do so, so thank you. Now, my I first question for yeah. you, uh, Professor Yogi, is what was the original spark that set you on the path toward developing materials that can quite literally pull water from the air? Well, uh, we have been developing materials by um, assembling them molecule by molecule, almost like molecular Legos, to make different forms. And upon examining, uh, examining the properties of, uh, of a member of this series of compounds that we made, we call MOFs, um, we discovered that in fact, not only can you take up water from air, but also you can release it under mild conditions. In fact, conditions uh, with temperatures that are similar to the desert. So immediately the idea came to me that uh, this powder uh, of moth could be set in a desert. It would take up water from the air, let's say at night, and during the day when, it, when the temperature uh, is higher, uh, water would come out and it can be condensed and you're basically making liquid water or drinking water. Wow. Now I'm curious, how do you, see your innovations addressing the biggest climate and water crises of today. And I guess my other question is, are we, are we too late? Is, it, is there still time to do this? We're not too late. I think that once society decides that there is a problem, uh, we will get to work and those problems can be solved. I mean, all these technological problems, once we decide, once we have the will to fix those problems, solutions, uh, emerged just like the solution that just received the Nobel Prize. And uh, so MOFs uh, are already deployed to capture carbon dioxide from flue gas of cement plants. And for water harvesting, it's uh, in 2026, Atoco um, is, a, is a startup company that I co-founded in Southern California, will be commercializing units that deliver almost 4,000 liters a day. These are electrified devices, and uh, they can operate for many, many years without having to replenish or replace the MOF material. Now, we also have another um, device that can deliver 850 liters of water a day with no energy input aside from ambient sunlight or the use of waste heat. So these are energetically very favorable conditions and, uh, and the water um, that is delivered is ultra clean and has no contamination in it whatsoever. It's drinkable after it's mineralized, but also could be used for agriculture, for household use, for hygiene. And uh, it's just water that is produced every day. Clean, clean water. I think this, these innovations sound amazing and I'm sure a lot of people in this room are wondering how far away are we from a future in which this is actually scalable technology that can be implemented and what exactly is holding it back? There is nothing holding it back. It takes time. Uh, for example, we, we discovered um, the water harvesting effect using MOFs back in 2014. And since then, we have been busy scaling up materials, configuring them into devices, deploying these devices in the desert and testing them in, for example, the uh, Arizona desert, the Death Valley desert. And now actually a team of researchers from my group is in Saudi Arabia, testing them in the desert of Saudi Arabia. So. Um, it takes time to figure out exactly um, the conditions under which uh, you could make devices that are most energy efficient so that the water you're producing is cheap and economical and could be scaled. So now we are at the production stage. We are, at, uh, we are about to announce these two products that I mentioned by Atoko. And, um, and, and uh, that's just the beginning of deploying these in society. Um, the second aspect of this is that to speed up these developments, we have been using AI and AI tools, machine learning, and as well as uh, large language models to not just transform what we do in the lab in terms of speed and accuracy, but also 
to address these challenges that everybody faces in going from a molecule to a material and then configuring the material in a device and then making sure that that device is operating robustly and commercialization. This value, this entire value chain can be aided by AI. And we have begun in the last three years, we've begun to carry out these kinds of studies with breathtaking success. We published over 15 papers that show how useful are LLMs and machine learning algorithm in speeding the tasks that we do in the lab as well as uh, the discovery and going beyond uh, that box that we have been uh, working in on the most chemists are working in. So exploring this amazing uh, gold mine that we have uncovered by our discovery of MOFs. Amazing. You've said before that science is a bridge between nations and cultures. I'm curious what you've learned about diplomacy through science in this era of very high geopolitical tensions. Over the years, uh, I've given lectures in many, many countries around the world, mm -hmm. thousands of lectures, and uh, often uh, we, we focus on science and the ability of science uh, scientific language uh, to cross, pe uh, cross borders and the, you know a chemical formula in Saudi Arabia versus other parts of the world is exactly the same thing. Everybody can understand that chemical formula. So it's a unifying language. The science is a unifying language that allows people to talk and to talk freely about um, something that is great to the development of their people, their country. So it is a common language, it's a powerful language to bridge our differences and to allow us to continue talking and talking about innovations, talking about how we can impact the next generation of thinkers. I think that makes a lot of sense. I, I've talked to a lot of Nobel Prize winners and often I feel like the sentiment they give is that the Nobel Prize often symbolizes kind of a completion of a project, yet I think your work, very much like you've said, feels like this is the beginning. You're still scaling, you're still moving forward. What questions are keeping you awake at night right now? What are you looking toward in the future? Well, I, I agree with you. I think the Nobel Prize was just the beginning uh, of this field. As I said, we have opened a gold mine. We're only scratched the surface. There's a lot more to be done. And I haven't told you about covalent organic frameworks or COFs. These are another entirely new class of materials that we have developed mm -hmm. using this new chemistry that we, we've been working on. So, uh, for example, uh, AI, I mentioned AI. I think the use of machine learning and large language models will be transformative to chemistry and materials, not just in terms of the speed with which these materials could be made, but also for accessing compounds, MOFs and COFs and other compounds that can address very specific problems, not just in clean energy and sustainability as we have been talking, but also in biomedicine and, and in, in, uh, in pharmaceuticals and other, other applications. Um, Catalysis, converting compounds from a harmful compound to a harmless compound. All these become possible because we can design materials with precision on the atomic and molecular level. So that's another, another dream of mine, is that could we design materials that operate like DNA, where you have sequences of information that code for very specific properties. Mm -hmm. So not only can we go from a material to a property, but also could you tell me, Omar, we want this particular property. Could we identify a structure? So going back and forth between materials to properties and properties to materials. And all of that is going to be enabled and made accessible, the, more accessible than ever before using AI. I Totally agree, and I wish you the best of luck. Thank you so much for joining us, Professor Yogi. Thank you. Thank you.